Semiotics is the study of signs and symbols and their use or interpretation. It is a subsection of linguistics that became its own distinct field of study at the start of the 20th century with the work of the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure's background was in comparative and historical linguistics. He was an expert in the study of Indo-European languages. In a series of courses that he gave at the University of Geneva, Saussure outlined his thoughts on creating a new field of study that would be a science of language. The study of languages at the time was commonly called philology, and it was a study of the development of languages rather than looking at living language. Saussure delivered the course on general linguistics three times in 1907, 1909 and 1911. He never published anything on the subject because he always felt that his work was too tentative and he hadn't found a solid ground worthy of publishing. But after his death in 1913, a group of students and colleagues of Saussure's took their notes on his course and compiled them into a book called Course on General Linguistics. This work ended up being highly influential in the 20th century in the development of semiotics as well as structuralism and post-structuralism, through which it influenced everything from anthropology and sociology to psychoanalysis and literary theory. In this episode we're going to explore the core pillars of Saussure's semiotics. First we're going to look at what semiotics is by looking at Saussure's distinctions between synchronic and diachronic studies of languages and between long and pole. Then we are going to look at the three core elements of semiotic theory, the structure of a sign, the arbitrariness of language, and Saussure's interesting claim that language is about relations and differences and not about naming. In demarcating the field of study for the nascent semiotics, Saussure drew a distinction between two ways of studying language that he called diachronic and synchronic. Diachronic, which comes from the Greek words dia meaning through and chronos meaning time, is the study of evolution of language through time. This was the classical field in which Saussure himself was already an expert. Philology and historical linguistics take the diachronic approach to language and explore the historical evolution of languages. Synchronic on the other hand comes from the Greek word syn meaning together and again chronos meaning time. And what Saussure means by the synchronic study of languages is the study of language at a moment in time without any consideration of its history or evolution. This diachronic synchronic distinction is Saussure's first boundary marker for semiotics. It's basically stating that this new science of linguistics that he is proposing is separate to the historical linguistics that is being done everywhere else. This new science is to explore the language itself at a moment in time. This distinction was later picked up in the sociological and philosophical traditions by thinkers such as Roland Barthes, Jean-Paul Sartre and Jacques Lacan. The next boundary marker that Saussure lays down is the distinction between long and parole. With the distinction between synchronic and diachronic study of languages, Saussure tells us that semiotics is the study of language in a moment in time rather than looking at its historical development. The distinction between long and parole tells us what aspect of this language at a moment in time semiotics is going to be studying. He distinguishes between two French words for language, long and parole. Long is the equivalent of the English word tongue. Like the English word, this captures a sense of articulate language, while also being the word for that all-important organ of language that you find in the mouth. The other word that Saussure uses is parole, which is usually translated in English as speech. Saussure uses these terms to refer to two different aspects of language. The difference between long and parole is the difference between language and speech. Long is the entirety of the structure of the language, while parole is the language as we speak it. With parole, we make the language concrete. We are using it in the flow of conversation, bringing the long to life and using it to communicate. But unlike this concrete instantiation of language, long is the abstract structure which is always behind parole and which parole draws upon. A good way of thinking about this is through music. So let's say you have a musician who's playing Mozart's Ein Klein Nacht music. This musician may miss some notes, they may add some flourishes, they may even stop halfway through. This individual instance and playing of Mozart is what Saussure means by parole. It is the concretizing of Mozart's music. The piece of music itself, however, the long, is always separate. The musical piece we call Ein Klein Nacht music is always separate from its concrete instances. It is one step abstracted from these planes of it. 
Some of these renditions may be closer to the abstract Einklein Nacht music, and some may be further away, but they are all separate to it. This abstract piece of music that we call Einklein Nacht music then is what Sessor means by long. When you speak English, you are like the musician playing Mozart. Your speech or parole is one instance of English, one rendition of the monolithic piece of music that we call the English language, or that Sassur calls long. Your speaking English is a concretizing of this abstract long that exists separate to any usage of it. The other thing that Sassur says is that long is social. It is never contained completely in one individual. There will be words you know of that I don't, and there will be words that I know that you don't. Sometimes I might even use the language improperly. This is all part of the incomplete instantiation of long in the everyday parole. What Sassur is looking to do with this distinction is to demarcate long as the field of study for semiotics. Semiotics is to be the science of long, of this abstract structure of language. This homogeneous structure of long is what Sassur wants to isolate and study with semiotics. Having marked off the territory of semiotics using these distinctions between diachronic, synchronic and between long parole, there are three revolutionary insights that Tussor outlined in his course in general linguistics that ended up being extremely influential in the intellectual landscape of the 20th century. The first of these is Tussor's definition of the fundamental linguistic unit. Tussor calls this unit the sign and there are two sides to it that he calls the signifier and the signified. These two aspects are as distinct and interdependent as the two sides of a coin. The signifier is the sensible aspect of the sign. In speech, it is the sound of the word, in writing it is the marks on the page or the pixels on the screen, while in sign language it is physical gestures and expressions. But these signifiers don't just have to be linguistic. Street signs or traffic lights are examples of signifiers that don't use words to signify. So the signifier is the word sign or symbol that points us in a certain direction. The signifier points us to the signified, the second aspect of Saussure's linguistic anatomy of language. So when you use the word tree, that signifier points me towards the signified, which is my mental concept of tree. This idea of the signified becomes clearer when contrasted with what Saussure calls the referent. The referent is the objective thing that we're speaking about. So if we take the example of a tree, then you've got the signifier in the word tree. This signifier points you to the signified, in this case, the mental concept of a tree, and together these form the sign. And separate to these two, you have the tree that you are experiencing in reality and trying to point to with your language. This distinction between the signified and the referent can be a little tricky to grasp at first. You might think that the signifier points directly to the referent, so why do we need this conceptual middleman called the signified? Well, this becomes clearer in the case of fictional entities. So let's take a dragon for example. Now we can have a number of signifiers for dragons such as fire breathing monster, a flying lizard, or we could take the word for dragon in all the different languages of the world. These are all different signifiers. But now if we were to go look for a referent, we would never find one because dragons don't exist. In the case of the dragon, it is clear that there is one thing which these different signifiers point to, and that this one thing doesn't have a referent. What these different signifiers do point to is a single signified, and that is the concept of a dragon. The concept that the different signifiers point to is what Sassur calls the signified. Having uncovered the signifier signified structure of signs, Sassur's exploration of this structure reveals two big insights. The first is that both signifiers and signifieds are arbitrary. In the case of signifiers, what this means is that the words we use for things are not necessary connections, but arbitrary ones. The word tree could just as easily have been bool or stug. There's nothing about the word tree itself that is inherently connected to the tree as we experience it. This makes sense when you think about the fact that the word tree varies from language to language, while doing just as good a job at telling people about the referent. There are exceptions to this which serve to make Saussure's point all the clearer. One exception is onomatopoeia. In this case, words like bang, meow or smack are not arbitrary. That is to say, they do actually bear a necessary relation to the signified. The word meow is intended to represent the actual sound a cat makes. But this is a case of the exception proving the rule. Most words do not bear any such connection and could easily be switched for another without any loss of effectiveness as signifiers. This is what Sassur means when he says that signifiers are arbitrary. But that is not all. Sassur also tells us that signifieds are arbitrary. 
This one is a little trickier to get your head around because you think, well, surely the concept of an oak is something fixed. But, says Sassour, if signifieds weren't arbitrary, then we would have this platonic realm of fixed concepts that we merely needed to put signifiers on. If this were the case, then we would expect all words to be directly translatable between different languages. The variation between languages would merely be a matter of changing the signifiers for different concepts. In English we say cat, in French they say chat. Same concept, different word. But that is not always the case. One example that Sassour gives is of the French word boeuf. If you were to translate this French word into English, you would have two choices. On the one hand, you might be talking about the food product beef, but depending on the context, you might also be talking about the animal that this food product comes from, the ox. What's going on here is that the French concept of boeuf does not exist in English. In English we have two concepts instead of one. We have two signified instead of French's one. The same goes for the French word belle mère. If you were to translate this word into English, you would have two choices, stepmother or mother-in-law. In both these examples, we can see that the French language has cut up the conceptual landscape in a different way to English. This conceptual landscape doesn't just vary between languages, but over time. The colour orange only entered the English language in the early 1500s. The word orange had been in English since the 1300s, in exclusive reference to the fruit, but over time it came to capture the colour between red and yellow. If you had asked an English speaker about the colours of the rainbow in the 1300s, their account would not have included the colour orange. But over time, the conceptual landscape has shifted, so that the concept of orange emerged as a distinct signified. In this case, it's not that the referent orange did not exist, it's that the way the landscape of reality was cut up by language was different. This is what Sassour is getting at when he says that the signified is arbitrary. He's pointing to the fact that the conceptual landscape varies across cultures and across time. Sassour's other big insight comes from the implications of this arbitrary nature of the signifiers and the signifieds. Because when Sassour realised that the signifier and the signified are arbitrary, he began to wonder how the hell language actually operates. And what he realised is that language doesn't work by naming things, otherwise it wouldn't be arbitrary. It communicates through a system of relations and differences. The example that Sassour uses to illustrate the principle is the 825 Geneva to Paris express train. Sassour says that we think of this 825 Geneva to Paris Express as the same train every day, even though the train itself may be a different vehicle. It may be operated by a completely different group of people, without a single passenger in common, and the train may even be late. Nevertheless, we all take it for granted that this is the same train, regardless of the physical train, the people, or even the time. What's important according to Sassour is that it be distinguished from the 1025 Geneva to Paris Express, the A25 Geneva to Dijon Local and all the other trains that are flowing in and out of the station. Another example is of a chessboard. Let's say you're missing a knight on the chessboard. You can easily swap in another object in its stead and this object will function as a knight because of its difference and relations to all the other pieces around it. This is what Sassour meant when he said that in the system of language there are only differences, but no positive terms. He was referring to the definition of terms requiring their relation to other terms in order to derive their meaning. So to summarise what we've covered, we looked at how Sassour demarcated the field of semiotics using the distinctions between synchronic and diachronic and between long and parole. These told us that semiotics is a study of language at a moment in time rather than historically and it is the study of the structure of language rather than its use in speech. From there we looked at the structure of the basic linguistic unit, the sign, and how it is composed of signifiers, the words we use for things, and signifieds, the concepts that these words point to. We then looked at how these signifiers and signifieds were both arbitrary and changed between languages and over time. And finally, we looked at what Sassour meant when he said that language works by relations and differences. That's everything that I wanted to cover on this episode of The Living Philosophy. If you've enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up down below and subscribe if you're new to the channel. If you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.